country venison steak and onions. Yeah, this is 4-2 here, just the, the short range forecast. Girls can fish. <laughs> High fives. When the local fellow deer got word we were visiting this forest, they ran for cover. But we're only using cameras, so we're not a real threat. But before we get into it, we learn a little bit about the hunting management of the area. We're with Garth Johnson from the Woodhill Fellow Management Committee, and Garth's going to fill us in a little bit on uh, the fellow deer and the uh, Woodhill area. Thanks, Clyde. Um, fellow deer were first released here at the turn of the century, around 1900, by the then landowner at uh, South Head on the South Compa Peninsula. Around Lake Otatari did two separate liberations of fellow deer. And then again in about 1955 there was another liberation down the Murawai end and over the preceding 55 years um, the, the herds have joined up so now the fallow deer are right throughout the Woodhill Forest and they're pretty much confined by the forest itself with the Tasman Sea on one side and farmland and the Kuiper Harbour on the other. How long uh, ago was the, um, uh, the management uh, committee set up? Yeah, 1987 I think they were first formed. We had our first public ballot, ballot back in 1988 and I've been running for the last 23 odd years, um, providing public hunting within the hunting blocks which are in the north end of the forest. Now here's one of the hunters uh, sitting on the side of the road here, so we'll, we'll just pull up and check him out. I see you've got a deer there. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, it's a doe and I've got a doe permit, so... How does a ballot work? Well, um, at the moment we have a website which is uh, www.fallowdeer.co.nz and the hunting season, uh, the ballots come out in about the uh, first week in March. They're drawn in the first week in April. Hunting starts in the first week in June and runs through to September. If your name is drawn out of the ballot, you are given a block for a day and you can take two hunting companions with you on that block and uh, there's a total of nine blocks so we put through about 750 hunters per year. Um, we estimate the herd at around about three to four hundred animals and so if you just do the simple maths we, we have some quite strict rules on what, what can be shot and what can't be shot and there are consequences uh, if you break our rules because as I said 750 hunters, 300 deer, if they shot the first deer that they saw that's it, you know, you're just uh, taking up the herd for the rest of future generations. So we're there to manage it, but we also provide the public hunting. We try to do work with DOC, with the landowners and with the forestry companies, and that's why we're doing some of the fencing projects to help preserve, to keep uh, DOC and the other stakeholders um, happy with what we're doing here. Here we go, Claude, this is the uh, end of our fence. This is what uh, part of the hunter's proceeds go to from the belt hunting, go towards fencing these areas of significant environmental west coast bush uh, which we're fencing off to keep the deer out of the bush and keep them in the forestry side of things. So we this year we've completed uh, one project up around the Otatai Reserve completely and we were taking uh, the deer have been removed or driven out of there and this year uh, we'll be completing this Hodges Basin project which is in the southern end of the forest. It's about 20,000 bucks a K to put the fence in so it takes quite a bit of hunter contribution. It's a slow process, we have to survey it get the stakeholders involved, which is the forestry company, DOC, and the local iwi, and when they get a consent, we then have to wait for the trees to be uh, milled so they don't fall on a newly established fence, and then we carry on. So this year, they've just clear felled this area, and we hope to complete this uh, fence. We've got another 2.1 k's to do. Steve and I were granted permission to try to get some photos of the deer in the area. And despite the breezy conditions, it wasn't too long before we had our first encounter. There's a deer just over the hill here. So what we'll do, we'll try and use this wind, the noise of the winds a really big advantage today. And we'll sneak through this toy toy or pampas grass and see if we can get some shots. But keep down.
box there. Yeah, I did it at the end day. Eh? It was quite a uh, extended period of time we were sitting here, yeah. wasn't it? But um, there was like there, there goes a couple more there. I think there's what seven or there's a group of four. I think there and three here, mm. and uh, it all started in the strong winds and just spotting one, sneaking in carefully, and then they sat down, and then it was a matter of really being patient and waiting to see what they'd do and how they'd respond, and they sort of took us pretty well. I thought the wind must be swirling all through that valley, Steve. Yeah, I thought so. But yeah. um, they hung around. Anyway, then three of them came wandering down this way, some black ones. I don't know if you saw them. Did you see those ones coming in? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so they came in nicely, and they're, you know, they're just there, so I was taking some good shots, I think. Bang, 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 and then they started to get that edge. You know, they knew something was wrong, and they get alert, and they sort of circle themselves up, and don't know which way to run. Anyway, they took off and the other ones got up and uh, did the same thing. Anyway, she's she's pretty windy, so we might just get the heck out of here before a tree comes down on us. Well, get a load of this. It's really quite fascinating. You'd be forgiven for thinking it was wire rope because in a lot of these forestry areas it was originally farmed, so there's a bit of wire and metal debris lying around. However, in this case, it's actually vines. They've grown up through the ground and then they've wound themselves around to form a perfect sort of rope. And I've no doubt that's extremely strong. You can just imagine some of the early Maori using that for various construction purposes, maybe tying their walkers to the shore and all that sort of thing. You can see how it's wound itself around an old piece of manuka here. And what's intriguing is how it's jumped across to the pine tree and it'll just gradually grow up there and it's really quite fascinating. Wow, tree just came down there. You've got to be careful in this wind, I tell you. Spooky. We managed to get some good shots of a doe, but it was really a buck we were after. The bucks are pretty hard to track down, so once we got onto this fellow, we weren't backing off. It was the rut, so bucks were responsive to some vocalisations. although my wounded sea lion impersonation seemed to repel the deer rather than attract them. Oh, that was a lovely little buck, wasn't it? It was a bit of a surprise, actually. We were making our way through this forest and uh, spotted him up ahead there and thought, oh, we'll give him a few grunts. Sure enough, he sort of appeared to be coming at a, a sort of a couple of spots there. And we followed on a little bit carefully, quietly. And of course, in this forest, you can go very quietly in some parts. Of course, as soon as you go to another block, it totally changes. It can go from sort of toy toy to bare needles. So, but when it's like this, it's really good for uh, sneaking through. Anyway, I did want to say that don't, and I'll say it again, don't be afraid to use a tree when you're taking your shots. Make sure you get next to a tree and rest against it, push that camera hard against it because when you get in a situation where there's a buck in your face you're going to be a bit nervous, okay, so you want all the rest you can get get a tree, rest on the ground, whatever you can do and then take your shot, perfect let's have a look at this little guy here you can see we can see him there, if I zoom in a little bit yeah. there's his little palmations on the top mm. very nice that probably wraps us up for the moment, so it's a lovely day, but we'll go and get some lunch. Right, block seven and six in the trailer. So tell me a little bit about the uh, Take a Kid Hunting project. 
Yeah, Take Good Hunting was uh, instigated by one of our committee members, Tony Gray, about uh, five years ago, and it's been picked up by another committee member, Mark Nobolo, and he's been running it for the last few years. We try and encourage young hunters to take up the sport of hunting with their parents or their guardians, and uh, for kids from the age of 12 to 18 can apply for a Take Good Hunting ballot. It's a free ballot, and we give them uh, a, quite a good arms briefing, um, bit about hunting, we give them a full morning's brief, give them some lunch, take them out into the forest and they can hunt a block with the parent or guardian for the afternoon. And uh, we're trying to foster this hunting, also it's a good outdoor activity, it doesn't involve uh, too much other you know, electronic gear, it's, um, it's good physical activity, it's good bonding with the parent and uh, we think it's a, it's a good legitimate exercise. And uh, so we're pursuing that and it has uh, increased in popularity from I think about 35 applicants in the first year to this year it's well over 300 for about 20 slots. And which yep. one's block 7 eight? You guys? Yep. yep. From here yep. back back north so yep. if you walk through here you'll find you'll come into some taller pines that's a yep. good place to start. Wander through the taller pines after you've been through the taller pines come back into the border between the short stuff and the tall stuff and you'll find the deer moving backwards and forwards. Um, those kids, uh, we had in the past we've had a guy that uh, came up with his father I think and he shot in the forest as a take kid hunting. Last year he, he, he bought his first rifle, he came up from Dunedin, came into the forest and he shot his first deer and he was just over the moon and that because that's the experience he got through the take kid hunting and we'd like to encourage a lot more hunters to do that or kids to take up hunting. As part of the program the local police address the young hunters about firearm safety. Uh, so, always treat your firearm as loaded as the first one, okay? Um, if someone hands you a firearm, check that it's unloaded and it's safe for you to handle. If you're handing one to somebody, do the same. Unload it, leave the bottle open. Okay, um, always point your firearm in a safe direction. In 1990, Rick Linton was shot by his hunting companion. His testimony is compelling. Either side, um, on one side, or maybe on the other side. And I was, I was sort of walking through the bush, looking for this, looking for this deer, and I'm walking through next to it, boom! And there's a, a huge noise, and I was, I was walking like this, but it struck in the shoulder here, it spun me around, I spat blood out of my mouth, it sort of knocked, you know, boom, knocked the wind out of me, and I sort of realised what had happened, and I, I, my, this arm was just sort of swinging, I yelled to a mate, oh you shot me! And he said, he sort of said nah, you had me on, yeah, you had me on. And he came over, and I was still holding my rifle with this hand, he, he sort of looked to me, looked to right, he said this hand was hanging down, it was actually sort of twisted around the other way, and it was like a, a tap of blood just pouring off, it was just pouring off. So the bullet came in here, uh, hit me in the, in the shoulder, and shattered below the, below the ball of the shoulder, just shattered the whole bone through, so the arms were swinging. There's a bit went across, right in the base of my neck, you'll see it on the, on the x-ray there, so a big bit right in the base of my neck, and it was shrapnel all through my chest. I put a chest drain in, so they cut, they cut it, push a tube into your chest, and that was, I said, you feel a bit of pressure here, and it was just, uh, it was just absolute agony, and then, it, then they said, oh, okay, it's not the right place, so they pull it out, and that was even worse, I'm going, ah, and then under here, they cut another one, so it's because of the blood in the air in your chest, they don't get that out, so they cut another one, and again, you see it on TV, you know, they cut the whole, push the tube in, that's very painful, and so they put another tube there, and I'm just saying, you know, knock me out, knock me out, so, Eventually they put me out, um, the first night I had an operation, you'll see the, the big steel frame which basically held my arm together and then I had a, um, what's called a pulmonary embolism where a blood clot goes through your heart and lodges in your lung or something like that. Um, I had uh, about six weeks in hospital, I was about three or four weeks in intensive care and then uh, because of that lung injury uh, I was, I was still, still very crook. My arm, I couldn't use my arm for um, over 12 months. I've still got a dislocated shoulder and that's the sort of height of my shoulder movement. I can sort of do this, you know, by reaching up, um, but it's, that's the extent of that shoulder. So you get a lot of pain in the shoulder still, but it's probably the best it's going to get. It doesn't slow me down too much. I, I still hunt actively. I've done karate, uh, did coast to coast in 2005. Um, so I'm still pretty active, uh, but again, it's just, it does look bit better. So.
Wirral Fellow Management Committee works closely with the local police and here today to talk to us is Constable Mike Boston from the Helensville Police. Welcome Mike. Thank Can you, you just tell us a little bit about the local police's role in the forest activities? Uh, our main role is, is protecting the public and the legitimate forest users that are in here. Um, safety is a, is a huge concern, especially around firearms. Woodhill Forest has uh, an estimated one million visitors to it per year and that's legitimate forest users. So the safety aspect is huge. Security forces uh, actively patrol the forest along with police, the local police stations. Um, under the Wild Animal Control Act, police and Ministry of Fisheries have powers to stop and search vehicles that are in the forest. Uh, and any firearms located um, can be deemed as, as, well would be deemed as unlawful due to that uh, being in possession of a firearm in an area where there are these animals around. Uh, so anybody in the forest here with firearms is essentially illegally hunting and police will prosecute uh, those found in here. So just to be clear on the rules uh, for the forest, um, there is no legitimate reason for anybody to be carrying a firearm in the forest. The only lawful hunting is done in the northern blocks, which is managed by the Woodhill Fellow Management Committee, and that is balloted hunting um, and closely managed. Uh, in the forest itself, at no times of the year is anybody permitted to be hunting any animals without a permit. The morning's talk continues with more valuable training from the experienced team. Secondly, if you're in the bush and you get lost, what do you do if you get lost? You stop. Stop is an acronym. Stop, think, observe. The last one's panic. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. The last one's not panic. What do you think the last one might be? Land. That's it. It's very simple. Anybody see anything wrong with that? The nose. Brown time. Uh, the what one? The nose is bent. The nose is bent. The yep. nose is bent. Yeah. And we've got a name for that and it's called Campy. Oh, you wrote that. Campy Logansomy, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. And, and um, apparently it's reasonably common, but this is the only one I've ever shot in the bush. But it's. More common and seeker, I think, mm. than it is in yeah. reds. Mm. And apparently, uh, I don't know how true the story is, but they, somebody told me that in the southern hemisphere they all point to the left and in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> 1981. So it had been on the ground for a long time, all covered in moss and everything, but you know, there's been some pretty good heads in there in, in the old days. And that, that's, that's uh, 41 and a quarter inches long. And if you look at the base of it, it's concave, which means it's an old animal. When the, when the base of the cast antler is concave, it's pretty old. When it's convex, it's, a, it's off a young animal. So, you know, you probably won't see one like that in SF90 again. Seeker cast antler, that's also from SF90. Uh, the rabbit patch at the end of the road. And, if, and if, you, if you come up later and look at the base of that one, compared with this one, you can see that it's um, quite round on here, so this is off a young animal. That was in the rabbit patch in um, 1960, right in the middle of the rabbit patch. <coughs> the road didn't actually go to there in those days. We actually killed a number of three truss boars uh, when, we were, when we were pig hunting, doing a lot of pig hunting. Um, but that's actually a four tusker. And you can come up and have a look at that later. It's pretty rare, I think. Concluding the morning's presentation is the hunting block draw. Uh, fin. Fin mum. And the young hunters are allocated their respective blocks. Paperwork's completed, sponsors' goodies collected, and she's all go. This track here, if you have a look at your map. To apply for or learn more about the Take a Kid hunting program, visit fellowdeer.co.nz. Well, this is what we like to see here. It's a fresh scrape or pad, similar to what the seeker deer do. They do a series of them within a given area to mark the territory. 
and he's dug it out pretty deep here and he probably urinated in it, rolls around in it. And you can see here the grass and shrubbery that he's dug up with his antlers showing a bit of aggression to the world and trying to warn off other stags from coming into the area. It's all good. We'll give a few grunts anyway. It's our last day in the Woodhill Forest, so I get to put my wounded sea lion call to the test again. I'm lucky this is a young deer, because his experience at identifying quality calling is limited. pressed on and came across increasing signs of buck activity. At this time of year, bucks can lose up to 20% of their body weight by chasing does and herding harems. And when there's does about, there's usually a buck not far away. Evidence. The deer had been here, that's a little couple of little tines and out here you get the palmation of the um, fallow deer so somewhere 20 years ago the stag was wandering around Then we heard it, the sound we'd been waiting for. That's what I can see. There was a group of deer and the buck was at the far side. The only thing to do was to risk the sea lion call once again and wait and hope. Lucky for me, Steve's fellow deer impersonation actually sounds like a deer. We got our shots and were privileged to spend time in the Woodhill Forest. Uh, at the last census, they reckon there was 25,000 active hunters in, in Auckland, and this is the only recognised deer herd in the Auckland region, so there's a quite a bit of pressure on it, and uh, so it needs management and because it's um, quite a small herd and it's, it can't be uh, repopulated from outside and so we've got to protect it and manage it so everyone can benefit from it into the future. 